Well, I first of all, I want to say thank you so much for having me with you this morning. Your pastor and his family have been down in my neck of the woods, down in the Orlando area. I'm actually from about two hours farther south than Orlando, um, since kind of south central Florida. I was uh, talking with someone earlier this morning, asked how long it had been in Kentucky, and uh, when I count the years up, my wife Donna and I, out of 33 years of marriage, we've lived 25 of them right here in Kentucky. Uh, we uh, lived uh, five years in Louisville, as, and, and where I pastored before leaving for Jakarta, Indonesia with the International Mission Board. We have since come back and in my 20th year at Southern Seminary, and we've just fallen in love with Kentucky. I was sharing with the earlier group that uh, as a young boy growing up, I remember on Thursday evenings uh, uh, the, uh, on NBC, this television show, Daniel Boone. Any of you remember that? Yeah, I, I used to watch that. Wouldn't miss it. Daniel Boone, wow. Uh, as a young boy, I just loved that show. Loved Daniel Boone, and I loved what I saw of Kentucky. It just looked like such a beautiful place. And, and I always thought, wow, how cool it would be to live in Kentucky. Well, it's not only cool, it's cold. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I still uh, have not grown accustomed to the winters, but uh, what a beautiful place beautiful people and uh, just glad to be with you bunch of Kentuckians this morning and uh, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 22 and we're going to talk this morning just a bit about the Savior whose great sacrifice we have <coughs> celebrated and remembered this morning from Matthew chapter 22 we're going to be in reading in verse 41 there toward the end of the chapter now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? I love the old King James translation here. What think ye of Christ? Literally, it is, what do you think of Messiah? Whose son is he? Well, the Pharisees, they were students of the Old, script, old Testament Scriptures. They knew the answer to that question. That was an easy one for them. Uh, the Messiah... The Christ, the anointed one, would be a descendant of David. So whose son is he? They answered correctly. They said to him, the son of David. And so Jesus asked another question. He said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Really, in order to understand this short text that we have read, we need to understand the context in which it is found. And Matthew gives us that context in chapter 22. Turn back a few verses to verse 15. And what we discover is that there are these individuals, actually they are groups, there are three groups, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. Each of them, in turn, approach Jesus with a question. What we understand real clearly, and Matthew alerts us to, is that the Pharisees are behind it all. And these are not honest questions. These are questions intended to entangle Jesus in his, in his talk in his responses. And if they can, to demonstrate to the crowds of people who are following him that he is less than a perfect teacher, that uh, he is less than a reliable teacher. So they come not as friends, not as those who are seekers, seeking to become his disciples, but they come as fault finders, mockers, even enemies of Jesus. In verse 15 of chapter 22, we read these opening words that the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his talk. It's clear. That is, their motives are clear, aren't they? And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. And so the Herodians are the first group who come to Jesus on this occasion. The Herodians were the Greek-speaking Jews. And they come to Jesus and they have a question that they want to ask. Notice the first thing they do, though, is they butter him up. Do you see that in uh, verse 16? Teacher, we know that you're true, that you only teach the truth. They're kind of patting him on the back. We know that you don't, you're not one of these guys who 
wets the finger and holds it up and sees which way the wind is blowing and you kind of get in line and go with the uh, crowds. You just tell it like it is. As we would say, or where I'm from, you explain it like it needs explaining. Um, they're patting him on the back, buttering him up. I don't know if you've ever um, been involved in debates, a debate, a debate club in high school or whatever. One of the techniques that they will teach you is to, um, you know, your opponent, kind of butter him up, flatter him, hurt. Uh, kind of, because then they, they kind of let their guard down and they're not as ready for you and you can catch them off guard. Makes sense, doesn't it? That's exactly the approach of the Herodians. Master, you're the one. You're the man. You're the one. By the way, we have a question we'd love for you to answer. And this is the question. Is it lawful, is it right, to pay taxes to Caesar? Now, they figure they've got him set up. Either way he answers, he's got real troubles, and he has created a bunch of enemies. If he answers... Pay the tax to Caesar. Who does he have mad at him? He's got the Jews mad at him. They despise Caesar. They despise all of his taxes and the oppression of Rome. They want to get out from under that. They want to cast it off. So if he says pay, yeah, go and pay Caesar. All the Jews, all his countrymen are going to be angry at him and come against him. But what if he says don't pay the tax to Caesar? Who does he have mad at him then? Caesar. And Rome. And now all the power of Rome comes against him. And you see, either way he answers, they figure he's created great problems for himself, and maybe his work will come to an end. They're not friends, they're enemies of Jesus, though they present themselves as friends. And so Jesus responds by asking uh, in the crowd, Does anyone have a coin? Of course, someone produces a coin, and he simply asks whose inscription is on the coin, and they answer it is Caesar's. Well then, give to Caesar what is his, and give to God what is his. Wow. That's a pretty good answer. If we could use a sports analogy from baseball, we might suggest that uh, in this give and take between the Pharisees and Jesus, that's strike one for the Pharisees. But they're not done yet. They've got another group that they send to see Jesus. In verse 23, the Sadducees. And Matthew tells us that the Sadducees are those who uh, say there's no resurrection. The, the Sadducees, you need to understand, were the liberals of their day. They did not believe the Old Testament scriptures. They did not believe the history that was found there. They thought much of that was mythology not real history. They did not believe in many of the miracles of the Old Testament, what God could do those sorts of things. They just didn't believe them. Not only that, they did not believe in a resurrection. They were the liberals of their day. Well, they have a question for Jesus also. But before they ask their question, they tell a story. There's this gal who gets married, this young man, young woman, they get married, and before there are any children, the husband dies, and she's widowed. According to the Old Testament kinsman redeemer law, the next closest male relative is to marry her. Do you remember this little story of Ruth, that little love story in the Old Testament? Remember Boaz? Remember Ruth's uh, husband had died and there were no children? And so Boaz married her. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer there. And so that's what's going on here. And the kinsman redeemer now marrying the widow is the first male child that is born of this marriage is to raise that son not with his name but with the name of the deceased, the dead man. And so that his name might be given to that, uh, son, to that son and that his inheritance, his properties might be handed down to that son and through that son so that his name and that his inheritance can be perpetuated from generation to generation. Make sense? You understand? Yeah. Well, the second, uh, it's a brother. These are all brothers. The second brother marries her, and before there are any children, he dies. And in succession, three, four, five, six, seven brothers marry her. Now, fellas, 
I don't know about you, but right there along maybe number three, number four, I might have been walking away from my familial responsibilities. What about you? Something's going on here. Nevertheless, the story is told. Seven brothers marry this woman. And so they want to know then, Jesus, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Now, there are a number of things that are going on in Jesus' response. And I think you kind of have to read between the lines. You have to understand what, what is going on here both uh, directly and indirectly, explicitly and implicitly. First of all, I believe that Jesus understands exactly what is going on here. And that these are a bunch of hypocrites, these Sadducees. They don't even believe in the resurrection. And yet they're asking about it? They're a bunch of hypocrites. Secondly, they are ignorant. Where I'm from is ignorant. They're just ignorant. They not only do not believe in the resurrection, they do not understand the resurrection and life in the resurrection. Jesus explains in some ways we'll be like the angels. There are other ways we won't be like the angels. One way we will be like the angels is that angels do not marry. Uh, angels do not begat. I love that old King James word. They do not begat. They do not have little baby angels. And so it is in the resurrection. We will not be given in marriage. We will not be having children in the resurrection. And so not only are the Pharisees hypocritical, they're also ignorant. But then Jesus, it seems to me, really goes to the heart of the matter with his last statement in verse 31. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. Do you understand what Jesus is doing here? He's really turning the screws on these guys. I think what he's saying here is, look, you feign, you pretend to have all this concern about this gal who has been widowed seven times. The fact is, whatever happens to her in the resurrection, she's dead. She's gone. The God of the scriptures is the God of the living. You're alive. You're accountable to him. You're going to have to deal with him. You better make sure that you are right with him. We can ask those other questions, but you better be asking yourself the question, am I right with him? That's the question that we should be asking ourselves this morning, isn't it? Am I right with the God who created me? Well, this is such an amazing answer that in verse 33 that we read that when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Might we return to our baseball analogy and suggest that here we have strike two. The third group that comes before Jesus, the Pharisees themselves. They have sent the Herodians. They have sent the Sadducees. Both of them have struck out. Perhaps what they're thinking is one of two things. Maybe they're thinking along the lines of that old adage. I bet you know it. I bet you can complete it for me. If you want something done well, you just got to do it yourself. Uh, So now it's time for them to step up the plate. The... uh, the, the big boys, you know, the others have struck out, and that's time for the cleanup batter. Uh, they might also be thinking in terms of a baseball analogy. That's assuming that they played baseball back then. <laughs> but they might be thinking, wow, you know, we've got two strikes here. Strike three, we're gone. We're out of here. It's time for us to step up to the plate. And so the Pharisees step up, and they also have a question to ask Jesus. It's about the greatest of the commandments. Now, they've got him. No way out of this one. They want to know, Master, what is the greatest of the commandments? They're thinking of the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, found in Exodus chapter 20. And just imagine, what if Jesus answers number one? Well, that's the greatest of the commandments. What are they going to say? Well, they're going to come back. They're fault finders. They're they're trying to entangle Jesus in his answers. They're going to say, wait a minute. What about numbers two through ten? Are they not equally the word of God? 
Are uh, they not equally binding on us? Do we have to obey only number one? Number, uh, what about numbers two through ten? Jesus, what are you saying? They know that that will put him in bad stead with the Jews if he kind of picks and chooses. What if he says number 10 is the greatest? What might they come back at him with? What about numbers one through nine? You see, they figure they've got him either way, any way he goes. What if he says number five? Well, Master, what about one through four and six through 10? They've got him. How does Jesus respond? Well, the first and the greatest commandments of the commandments is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And the second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. What has he just done? He has summarized the entirety of the law. If you were to go back to Exodus chapter 20, and you were to read the Ten Commandments, you would find basically two categories of commandments. The old theologians used to talk about the two, ta the two tables of law. Not the, literal, not the actual stone tablets, but the two tables of law. The two categories of law that are found in the Ten Commandments. The first four regulate our vertical relationship with God. They have to do with our God Godward relationship. The latter six have to do with our relationship with one another. And what has Jesus just done? He has summarized both of those, all of that, and in essence said to the, responded to the Pharisees, <laughs> fellas, you don't get to pick and choose. It's all the Word of God. And you are accountable for obeying every one of them. May we return one more time to our baseball analogy? And what do you expect me to say? Strike three. They are out. Well, now it's time for Jesus to begin asking some questions. That brings us to our text. Some of you are wondering, wow, we're just now getting to the text. It's almost noon. Don't, don't worry. It's what we preachers always say. Don't worry, we'll get finished. Um, first question, very simple. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Again, the Pharisees know the Old Testament scriptures. They get that one right. He's the son of David, a descendant of David. Then Jesus asked him a second question. How is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Let me kind of paraphrase and rework this question for our benefit this morning. And set it in context. In the Jewish worldview, it was always the descendant that was to give honor and reverence to the ancestor. The younger giving homage, honor to the elder. Now that just makes sense to us, doesn't it? That, that seems right. Um, I remember I have three children, a son and then two daughters. And I remember as each of them turned 16 and got their driver's licenses. Some of you can remember that. And um, just imagine, if you will, uh, how uh, absurd this would be. Um, I need the car one day to run down to the corner of Walgreens or wherever it might be. And I find Paul, my son Paul, and I go to Paul and I say, Paul, can I borrow the keys to the car? Can I borrow the car? I need to run to Walgreens just absurd. Rather, it's the other way around. Paul wants to maybe go over and visit one of his friends, maybe one evening, he wants to go over to Dustin's or whosoever place it is. And so what we would expect is that Paul would come to dad, the younger come to the older, and ask very reverently, dad, I'd like to go over to Dustin's this evening, may I borrow the car? Now, that seems right to us, doesn't it? See, see, we understand what's going on here. That's the normal way of things. But what Jesus asks about is not the younger giving reverence and homage to the elder, but the elder. And by the way, this is not just any elder. This is not just any ancestor. This is 
the greatest of all human kings. This is the great king David. How is it then that David gives honor and reverence to his descendant? But he even goes farther than that. He bows the knee to his descendant and worships him as Lord and God. How can that be? And what is the answer that they give? How do they respond to Jesus when he asks, how can that be? That's exactly right. You got it right. They were silent, even as you were silent. We read here in verse 46, no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. They're out. I want you to notice something, and this is kind of a practical ministry vein. Jesus did not run after these guys. He did not just kind of woe is me. They didn't hear me. They didn't listen to me and just plead with them and beg them to give him a few more minutes. He let them go. They were never coming as friends. They were never coming as seekers of truth. They never truly desired to become his disciples. They were fault finders. They were enemies from the get-go. You know, in our ministry of the gospel, especially as we have opportunity to share the gospel with others, I think there's something that we need to say very clearly to those to whom we go. And in fact, need to say it here this morning in case there's anyone here amongst us who falls into this category. You must not come to this book. You must not come to this gospel. You must not come to this Jesus in the same way that the Herodians and the Sadducees and the Pharisees did on this occasion. Don't come playing. Don't come playing games. Don't come fooling around. Don't come insincerely. Because if you do, you will go away just as angry and empty and bitter as did the Herodians and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Don't come to this Jesus playing games. On the other hand, we also must say to those to whom we go with the gospel, we must tell them that wonderful promise that was spoken of by Moses, was picked up by the prophets and quoted, and quoted in the New Testament by those writers. And the promise is this, and that is that when you seek me and search for me with all your heart, then you will find me. Oh, we need to say to those who are bound up in sin and lost and under God's condemnation, hopeless, we must say to them, we must tell them the truth about their sin and the predicament that it puts them in before a holy God. But we also must say to them, there is a Savior. There is good news. And this Savior is not far off. He is not difficult to find. But He is near. And He delights to say, I heard an old preacher put it this way once. He said, Jesus is closer than the front of the church building. You know, sometimes it seems like we as Baptists think the only place you can find, sinner can find Jesus is up here somewhere, right up here. Amen. Um, Jesus, this old preacher said, Jesus is closer than that. In fact, he said, Jesus is closer than the tips of your fingers even. Wherever there's a prayer for mercy, where there, wherever there is a plea for forgiveness, there you will find Jesus. Don't be like the Herodians and Sadducees and the Pharisees, but seek him and you will find him. Well, we can't be done just yet because we don't have an answer to the question. How is it that David not only honors his descendant, but bows the knee to him and worships him as Lord and God? Turn to Revelation chapter 22, the very last chapter in the Bible. Revelation chapter 22. Let me begin reading in verse 12. Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. 
Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel or my messenger to testify to you about these things for the churches. Well, it's a different audience here. He's not talking to fault finders and enemies, but he's talking to his own people. He's talking to the churches. And this is what he says. I am the root and the descendant, or the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Do you understand the testimony of Jesus here? Do you understand the claims, the astounding claims that he is making? He says, I am the root of David. What's he claiming with that statement? I made David. I created David. David owes his very life to me. I made him. I'm the root of David. You think about a plant and uh, the portion of the plant through which water and nutrients come and give life. It's the root. Jesus says, I made David. I gave him life. With this, what is he claiming? He's claiming to be creator. Creator God, very God a very God. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I am also the descendant of the offspring of David. Well, here is that wonderful mystery of the person of Jesus. And isn't it a mystery of sorts? We believe it. We affirm it. We preach it. We testify of it. But still, isn't there still that measure of mystery that this God this eternal God, this infinite God could be born of a woman, the Son, and a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in an animal trough. That's God. And he grew into childhood, and he grew in to his adolescent years and to a young, as a young man. And then there came that time when he began to preach and to heal and to go from village to village and he made his way ultimately to Jerusalem. Taken as Peter tells us in Acts chapter 2 in that great Pentecost sermon taken by wicked men and nailed to a cross. Laid in a grave. Tomb couldn't hold him, could it? Three days later, he came out. Spoke with many. And now is ascended there to the right hand of his Father in heaven. Fully God. Fully man. The only suitable Savior, the only effect, effectual Savior is this one. Who is fully God. Fully righteous without sin. But fully man. And he has given himself a sacrifice. Again, we celebrate this morning not the sacrifice of four-legged animals or birds or any other sort of a thing. But as, that we, as the writer of Hebrews puts it, we celebrate, we remember that one sacrifice by which comes the forgiveness of sin. If you know this Jesus this morning, rejoice in Him. You have in Him the greatest of all gifts. You have in Him abundant life right now, the assurance of the forgiveness of sin. But you also have in Him eternal life. We sang about it this morning. Death, where, where's your sting? Death, grave. You know, where, we do not fear these things because of Jesus Christ. Rejoice this morning if you rest in Him. If you are not resting in Him through repentance and by faith, I want to say to you again that this Jesus, He's not out there somewhere having to be hunted down. And he is here. And wherever there's a prayer for mercy, a plea for forgiveness, you will find Him. Run to Him. Plead with Him. Ask Him. He delights to save those who come to Him. In just a moment, musicians, we're going to stand. Musicians are going to come to the front. We're going to sing. 
congregations gathered here. It might be that you have something you need to share with us as a congregation. Perhaps there is a great concern in your life, uh, an urgent prayer matter. I tell you, you ought to come this morning and share that with us so that we can pray with you and for you. Don't be bashful. Don't be hesitant. This is family. The scriptures tell us that we should pray for one another. How can we pray for one another if we do not know how we need to pray for one another? You come this morning and share that. It might be that the Lord has saved you, but you've never given that testimony aloud so that others might hear. We want you to come this morning and share with us how the Lord has saved you. And we, we'd love to rejoice with you as we hear that testimony. It might be the Lord is leading you to plant your life here with this congregation. Congregation is gathered. You ought to come this morning and share that so they might receive you and welcome you. You can walk together with them. There might be other matters. It doesn't make anyone more holy than another to walk to the front here in a few moments and to do any of these things. But it is an opportunity for us sort of publicly and congregationally to share with one another. I'm going to be here at the front. Brother Darrell will be here. You probably make, if you come, you'll probably make your way to him. You, don't, you still don't know who in the world I am much, but, um, but we invite you to come and share what you might need to share with the congregation this morning. Let's pray, and then our musicians will come and we'll sing. Father, we do thank you for um, this wonderful time of celebration and remembrance around the Lord's table. We thank you especially for the one whom we remember and for his great sacrifice on our behalf. Father, let no one go from this place this morning without a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Draw us all to him. And as we go from this place, certainly there are many in this building who have family members, who have friends, who have colleagues and schoolmates who do not know Jesus. Father, as we go out this afternoon, as we go out through the week, fill us so full of rejoicing that we cannot do anything but help to speak of our Lord to those who need him so desperately and let them hear and let them be drawn also we thank you Father for all that we have in Christ in his name we pray